money comes with personality and SAS money has a lot of personality because this money has been built up over 20, 25 years of hard graft. This was a house that was going to fall down, but we've taken something that was dilapidated, unmortgageable, and we've now turned it into a desirable property. We're building a future for our son, any children he may have, great-grandchildren that we may never know or see. There is no one else to say, what should I invest the pension in? Because it's your decision, it's your job. I am a financial partner with my life partner, my husband. And for me, that's incredibly empowering. Welcome to episode 236 of Wealth Talk. My name's Christian Rodwell, the Membership Director for Wealth Builders, joined today by our founder, Mr. Kevin Whelan. Hi, Kevin. Hi, Chris. Good to be with you again. Toby, he's a stalwart, isn't he? So Toby Spanier and his wife, Kate, join us on the podcast today. And Toby is a name that should be well recognized by our members. He's uh, well, He's been a member himself for many years and uh, progressed to now being a wealth coach. And uh, what a fantastic coach he is. But uh, today he's joined by his wife, Kate, because they're recent award winners at the Property Investor uh, event, which was took place just for Christmas. And they won the SAS Investor of the Year Award. And, uh, you know, I remember going back when I first met them and uh, I'm sure they had um, a little ounce of scepticism. I think they reveal that in the interview, don't they, um, when they came to see me. And uh, I think I remember Kate saying to me uh, later on, you know, that she was uh, genuinely inspired by the meeting and has gone on to take some great actions. And it's nice to see the counterbalance, isn't it? So not just hear from Toby, who's you know, probably much more in the limelight than, than Kate, but Kate is absolutely, you know, a powerhouse behind the whole kind of engine of the Spanier family wealth and their, and their son Max as well. So, you know, great, great to see. And, and just, just one thing I want to mention, uh, which I think is really important in all of this, Toby and Kate are probably the most generous people I've ever met. Uh, generous in spirit, generous in money generous in, in every aspect of their personality. And uh, they've invited me to dinners before to thank me. They've invited uh, me to lunch um, coming up to see how they could work even more closely with us in uh, the remainder of the year. And uh, they never shy from uh, exploring that uh, relationship generosity and making deposits in the piggy bank of life and they do it so fantastically well, and I'm sure their son Max will, uh, sponge-like as they are at sort of nine, ten years of age, will be picking up some amazing lessons from a wonderful family. So I just want to reveal a personal side that um, I resonate with Kate and, and Toby uh, completely. We won't give too much away because there's some real nuggets in uh, the conversation today. But what I will say is that the very first step of the roadmap that we teach our members is all about family awareness. It's about really triggering that spark, that catalyst inside of you. And uh, Kate shares that catalyst moment for herself today. And um, and it's all tied into legacy, which we know when we speak to our members, Kevin, is really at the heart of what's driving most people who, you know, have a family in their lives. It's uh, it's about building that legacy, something to be proud of. Well, you know, I, I hear the word legacy a lot, and, and I think it's important, uh, particularly, you know, for those who have an aspiration and ambition for wealth to be transferred down the generations, even to people they'll never meet. And it's likened to that quote, isn't it, that it's a, it's a wise person uh, who plants a tree and never to be experienced the shade of it for themselves. And I think that's that's true. But I think it's equally important, and uh, I do relate back to a recent podcast with uh, Lisa Hunt when she was talking about legacy, but, but in reality was she was talking about things like travel, you know, wanting to travel and, and allowing that um, – that flexibility and freedom of travel with her children so that they had an enriching and an um, experience in life. And I think that's what creating lasting permanent wealth does. It allows you to help people be who they want to be. And that's your children as well as in, in this case. And I, I do remember Kate saying, I, I want to support Toby so he can be who he wants to be. And I think so all aspects of that legacy are about allowing 
whoever is on the generational list, alive or, or in the future, to live a life that they would be best designed to, to be living. And I think that's what legacy is all about. It's not just the legacy of death, it's the legacy of life. So get ready to find out all about this SaaS deal that won Toby and Kate, the SaaS Investor of the Year Award. And we'll be back afterwards for the, our usual debrief. Toby, Kate, welcome to Wealth Talk. How are you both? Good, thank you. Good. Toby, you're a veteran of Wealth Talk. We've had you as a guest before. And of course, our members will know you as one of our wealth coaches. So great to have you back today. But great to have Kate joining you, your wife, Kate. And and the reason why we're speaking today is, of course, to celebrate the recent award that you both won. In fact, Kate, as the SAS Property Investor of the Year. So uh, well done. Congratulations. I know that both of you were involved in this and we'll find out about the deal. But before we do that, I really, Kate, I'd love to find out from you kind of tell me a bit more about your involvement and obviously being up on stage, picking up that award. How, how was that that evening for you? It's definitely going to go down as a highlight of my life, which I never thought I would say. And it was a bit hilarious because... We, the SAS Property Investor of the Year was the first award up. And I don't think they'd quite run through the technology. So rather than for every other category, all the, the kind of finalists came up on, on the screen. And then there was the big reveal. Whereas for our category, it was just the big reveal. So I'm Toby and I are halfway across the ballroom to go up on stage. And then we were like, oh, hang on. Now, now Ian Morton's picture's gone up was it us? And then they're like, where's Kate? Where's Kate? And I thought, well, you stuck me at the back of the room for a start. So it was quite a walk through. But um, yeah, it was just, it was an, it's always an incredible experience. Any kind of award that you're nominated for, or you, you're a runner up for, or you actually win, just being in a room of people celebrating you, getting that recognition is tremendous. And then the people that want to talk to you afterwards, you know, that networking, Even if you're just a finalist, you know, to see the passion for the industry in the room is is really quite overwhelming and captivating, I would say. And I'll come back to just a bit more about that in a second, Kate. But Toby, just for our members, uh, you know, they've known you as a coach for the last couple of years or so. But tell us just about the last few years for you, because you've transitioned, haven't you, out of the corporate world to becoming full time investor and now also coaching as SaaS coach for wealth builders as well. So your experience with SaaS certainly goes back a few years. Yes. Yeah, so I left university and I joined Deloitte as a management consultant. I was the second year that Deloitte took people directly from university as management consultants. And I was there for, guess what, Christian, 25 years, 25 years. And I got to year 20 and I thought, do you know what? I mean, this has been a great career, but do I really want to do it forever? And do I really want to do more than 25 years? And the answer was no, I didn't want to do more than 25 years. And I thought, well, but um, I can't just, if I just stop, then what are we going to live on? Um, We need something else. And so I decided at year 20 that I was going to do property and build up a property portfolio so that when I left Deloitte, it wouldn't massively impact the standard of living of my family. I started buying properties at uh, uh, back in 2017. At the same time, I heard about SAS and um, basically Kate and I set up a SAS and it's been supporting the property portfolio all the way through. Other than the first initial properties that we purchased, I think every property that we bought has had some SaaS money. We'll talk a bit about this later, but the SaaS has been involved, has been supporting pretty much every deal that we've done henceforth. And we're on like deal 67. So there's quite a few deals in there where the SaaS has been able to support. Absolutely. Well, we're going to dive into the details specifically around the the deal that won the award. Take me back to that point where you first heard about SAS, because uh, if I'm correct, both of you actually uh, went and, and met Kevin, and uh, that was at Wealth Builders headquarters in East Grinstead. So, so Kate, take us back to that meeting. What was your sort of feelings, your mindset about about property, about SAS, about the whole investing world? I suppose at that time. So obviously, you know, Toby's talked about it, it's very evident to most people when they meet Toby or they hear Toby, he's got a real affinity, a passion a lifelong mission to 
be in property, investing, coaching, whatever guys, but it's his real passion. And it isn't mine in the same way. You know, I'm an incredibly supportive partner. I want Toby to be doing what fulfills him, what makes him happy, what makes him get out of bed every day. And he's he's the same with me and the, the strange things I get involved in, in the sort of nine, nine to five. But uh, he came, I remember him coming back from either a property meet or a training and Kevin had obviously spoken. He's like, right, I've booked an appointment. We're going to go and meet this guy in East Grinstead. I just want to know more about it. I'm not, I'm not convinced. It kind of almost sounds too good to be true. And I was like, oh, I, I, have I got to come? Oh, East Grinstead? Oh, I've got to leave the village? Oh, oh and it's about property? Oh. Anyway, I think for me it was one of a, a standout ex- part of my personal property journey because any of you who've had the pleasure of meeting Kevin – well, you know, you're blown away by his passion for what sasses can do, what being in control of of your future can do for you, for your family, for your future generations. And um, I think I came, we were coming home and I said to Toby, cool, I'm really excited. This is, this is like, and Toby, there's this one term that Toby really hates, game changer. But I have to admit, after that meeting, I was kind of like, this is game changing. It's life changing. I'm completely honest. The SAS is the one part of our portfolio that I'm most excited about because it's not just the fact that we're in control of our pensions that we wouldn't have got our hands on for, well, God knows how long because every year it seems it gets pushed back to, you know, 57, 58, 59. Yeah, who knows when our generation actually will be able to get their hands on the money they've been saving and investing. So taking that control back, that excites me. I like being in control of my future, my destiny. And also doing something with my my husband that I can get on board with too. And to come away from that initial meeting with Kevin thinking, this is exciting because this is something that I'm, I'm happy to support Toby in. And um, just that concept of, you know, knowing that we're building a future for our son, a financial, a firm son, financial future for him, any children he may have, you know, great grandchildren that we may never know or see. Just that's, that's powerful. And another thing that Toby always had, you know, used to sort of often talk about is how do, how do we create a legacy? How do we live forever? And I'd be like, oh God, it's one of these existential questions of his, you know, yeah, right. I don't know. How do we live forever? We have a sass. You know, we'll be long gone, but that small self-administered scheme will be trucking into the future. And to get all of that out of that initial meeting with Kevin, I was I was like, okay, what do we do? Where do we sign? And it's it is rare for me to get this excited and this passionate about anything around finance, property. It's just it's not my jam like it is Toby's, but SAS ticks a lot of boxes for me. And Toby, you're you're now a SAS coach uh, for Wealth Builders members. But for any listeners who perhaps don't understand exactly, you know, how do you set up a SAS? Can you just quickly talk us through what that process was like for yourselves setting up the SAS? Well, the key thing is making the decision to set it up and the decision of which company you do go to to help you get it set up. Once you made the decision, it's kind of it's pretty easy. There's a load of admin. There's a load of form filling. Everything in the pension industry is really slow. So don't expect it to happen overnight. But it eventually happens. So you don't need to know all the technical ins and outs of how to do it. That's why you basically partner with a a specialist pension uh, administrator who does all the heavy lifting for you. What you need to do is make the decision of whether it's the right decision for you to basically take control of your own pension. And uh, rather than someone else decides what your pension's invested in, you decide what it's invested in. And with that comes a responsibility. You know, you're actually taking on another job. So if you have a SAS, you've suddenly promoted yourself to finance director, chief investment officer. There is no one else to say, what should I invest the pension in? Because it's your decision. It's your job. There isn't some IFA out there. Um, there isn't some, you know, board of trustees at some big pension fund like, you know, Standard Life or Aviva. It's, it's up to you. And a lot of people don't really get that. So it's another job uh, on top of the many jobs you have. But it's probably one of the most fun jobs because, you know, who doesn't like shopping? especially when there's money there that otherwise you wouldn't be able to 
touch or feel or do anything with until you're 55 or 57 or uh, perhaps later. So uh, it just enables you to um, use money, which is kind of like dead money. You know, this uh, statement people get once a year, don't know what to do with it, stick in their drawer. And then the next year, another statement arrives, they stick it in the drawer. It doesn't mean anything. All of a sudden, that number means something because you can actually use that cash to invest in a business or businesses and to support your own business. That's the key thing that, that SAS enables you to do. And what pensions did you use between the two of you in order to get the SAS set up? I worked in the charity sector for that was my my main career um so I had you know a really nice woolly ethically invested not growing very much pension which we actually took longer to liberate than Toby's you know corporate impressively large pension because Toby's like oh they're not going to want to pay that out and actually it happened really quickly my one which was kind of bit mediocre compared to his took ages to to get released by uh the the pension fund but what what for me has been great is actually seeing some some kind of pension equality if you like you know toby as i said i worked in the charity sector doesn't attract to the rates of pay that being in professional services attracts fact so obviously Toby's pension was always going to be far more healthy than mine. But by use, by putting both of them together in the SAS, I've been able to grow my part of the pension pot. It makes me feel like more of an equal partner. And unfortunately, one of one of the, the key things about being female in this world is we are the ones that have to sacrifice something if we want to have children and grow a family. You know, it is harder for for us to, de- to to earn what what our male counterparts earn. And, you know, it's, this isn't a case about whether that's fair. That's a whole other conversation for other people. But what I love now is that I am financially pulling my weight, if you like, by having taken a, a pension that was never going to achieve much where it was and porting it into our SAS. I am a financial partner with my life partner, my husband. And for me, that's incredibly empowering to and that, to actually, you know, be able to say, no, 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 I don't, I don't want us to invest in that. I want it to go here and I want to do that with, with my bit of the fund. Uh, and because we are this small scheme and it is just the two of us who are trustees, Toby can't just go off and do what he wants without me agreeing and vice versa. And so you go from feeling like you don't really have a voice in what's going on in the financial hilarity that can be married life to suddenly, you know, you are, oh, well, I, you know, I am an equal partner in this. I don't want anyone to think that I've, I've never been an equal partner in our marriage, far from it. But I think it's just the way the world is. It, it's it's harder for, for wives, female partners. It just is. It's just the way the world is. But this gives you, well, it certainly feels like it's given me some kind of gender equality, which is not what I thought I would say about my SAS ever, but it's true. So it almost sounds like the the wealth building journey was almost like life before SAS and then life after SAS. So when that SAS was created, did that change your mindset, Toby? Because you've been obviously working on the buy to lets and it sounds like that was kind of your thing a bit more. Once the SAS was there, as you say, now it's a joint decision. It was a joint strategy moving forward. So, so, so how did that dynamic change? Yeah, so the biggest mistakes I've made is when I've just run off and gone shopping and bought stuff and haven't spoken with anybody else. With the SAS, this is the thing a lot of people don't realise. Um, so Kate and I are member trustees. We are basically the financial directors, the chief executives. We are the everything of, of the SAS. And that means that uh, all decisions have to be unanimous. This is why uh, SAS small self-administered schemes tend to be very small because you need someone that you really trust. And if Kate doesn't sign the chitty, then I, I can't do anything. And so with any investment, I've got to explain it to Kate. And she goes, oh, don't sound, don't like the sound of that. What if this happens? What if that happens? And it forces me to think through, have I really thought this through? Have I thought about the risks here? Is this actually a silly investment? This is a pension you're meant to be more conservative with your pension funds than you are with company funds than you are with personal funds. I think, yeah, I've also got responsibility just not to myself, but also 
to future generations. Our SaaS, we have a 100-year business plan for it. So, you know, if I make a stupid decision now, it can affect future generations that I'm not even going to meet. And I want to have a life of significance. I want to have a legacy. And I shouldn't be taking a silly decision that's going to screw that all up. And by Kate asking me questions, sometimes very simple questions like, what is this for? <laughs> it just puts that uh, pressure on me to go, oh, yeah, let me just, uh, how can I explain this? And sometimes I'm explaining and go, it sounds like a, it sounds not good. Perhaps this isn't the right thing to do. So I think it's really useful. And when we started the SAS, as Kate mentioned, I had 97% of, uh, 93% of the funds of the SAS. So 93% was my money that went in my pension. Kate had 7%, but she's an equal partner. She says, no, I can't do anything. And, you know, that parity, I think is really, really important. Um, as time went on though, we made some profits in our limited company. And uh, we decided that all those profits should be a pension contribution to Kate's part of the SAS. Uh, and that sort of leveled out the, the percentages. So um, I think it's been a useful check and balance for me. And often when I'm explaining something, I go, I sound crazy. This isn't right. I need to go back and renegotiate this. So it's been really helpful. Now, before we get into the details of, of the deal that won the award, Take me back to that first use of the SaaS. So what was the first deal? And, and was that a scary moment? Because, Toby, you must come across this when you're coaching certain clients who've set up a SaaS, where they don't actually do anything for, you know, six months, 12 months. And sometimes it's a bit of fear. Suddenly you've got this money. It's your pension. You don't want to make a mistake. So so did you have any of that element of fear at the beginning yourselves? Definitely. I'm assuming Kate's going to say anything, but uh, definitely. So. You know, it takes a long time. It takes about six months of the process to work its way through, to set up a SAS, get HMRC approval, and then to get these pension funds to let go of their own money. Because every day they delay, they're making a commission on it. So there's no interest in them being hyper-efficient. They'll, they'll, they'll drag it out for as long as possible. And then the money arrives and you go, wow, we can actually see a bank account and it's got a huge amount of money in it. Shucks, what do we do now? And you're so relieved that you got through this hurdle of, oh, we've got the money you then think, oh, now we've got another problem. We've got this huge amount of money. If we leave it where it is, it's way more than 85K. So if the, the if that bank goes down, we're only insured under the financial services compensation scheme for 85K, and everything else is lost. So you, you've got this pressure that you need to deploy the funds, but you don't really know what to deploy the funds in, or you may you may have some ideas, but it's not the right time. Things take take a while to do. So what I, what I say to my coaches and what we did was, well, what was the pension invested in before? Oh, it was just in an all share tracker, an S&P tracker with Vanguard, passive, low cost. Well, why don't we just do the same thing? So the first thing we did was to set up, basically bought, bought shares in a tracker. And it was doing exactly the same thing that it was doing in the Deloitte pension, in the in Kate's pension. So that's fine. It's now invested. It's deployed. It's secure. It's within a financial institution where there's various guarantees that the money can't go missing. Um, and it's exposed to the stock market and it's you know, gradually increasing over time. But without their fees, without their fees, without their fees. So it's, it's more, it's more cost effective because you don't have a fund manager telling you what to do. You know what to do. Just deploy it in the same thing it was before. And then as time went on, there were opportunities to use them. You know, you've got a lot of flexibility with the SAS. Opportunities came up to deploy our pension in more effective ways to support our uh, limited business. Uh, and so as those opportunities came up, you sell some shares, you move the money into something else. It did take a bit of a while to, for me to get my head around it. And, uh, you know, I, we set the SaaS up at about the same time that we set the limited company up. So they've both been developing at the same time. For me as well, I think with that, the first steps, once we had our money in our SaaS, it's a bit overwhelming. And I can see why there are, you know, people who are new to having a SaaS. It takes a while to get going because you know, with great power comes great responsibility. And all of a sudden, you've got this, this pot of money that you didn't think you would be responsible for. And there's that God, what if what if I, what if we don't choose the right thing to put some of that money into? I certainly struggle sometimes with the what ifs. Well, what if that doesn't go the way you think it's going to go, Toby? What if we don't get that return, Toby? what what if and i think also I, sometimes that's my job as as a as a member trustee to to ask those what if questions to make him trot off and do a bit more due diligence until i'm happy but it it, it can be a bit overwhelming because all of a sudden it's like oh my god I, I know i've got to do something with this what do i do 
money comes with personality and SAS money has a lot of personality because this money has been built up over 20, 25 years of hard graft. You know, a lot of blood, sweat, toil, tears are in those funds. So that money is really precious because that represents, you know, all your working life. And so it just creates more pressure on how you deploy it. You don't really want to lose that money because you've worked so hard to build it up. But again, you don't want to be paralyzed into not making a decision. You need to make a decision. And this is the first thing about having a SaaS people miss. You are the trustee. You make all the investment decisions. Uh, it's, it's another job, but it's a fun job and you can go at your own speeds and you basically start learning, uh, because you've got the ability to, to, to tra transact was before you basically had no ability to do very much with your pension. Yeah. Hence the reason for having good support around you and seeing others who are already successfully deploying their SaaS can give you that confidence and the ability to talk to them and reassure you. I'm, I'm sure. Yeah. I mean, when we set up our SaaS, there wasn't a coaching. I don't think there was a coaching program. So we just had the SaaS, the money dropped in, and then we didn't know what to do. <laughs> it took us a while to figure out. Now, you know, the industry's developed a bit more and, you know, coaching can be really helpful, just hand holding, um, you know, people to take little steps to get their money deployed in a safe and secure way. Okay, so let's dive into the details of, of this deal. And um, from what I understand, you know, the property in question was described as dilapidated, unmortgageable. So what did you see in this property that others might have missed? And, and who would like to walk us through this deal? Toby is, is the man for the detail on the deal. But I think you've hit on some really interesting words, dilapidated, unmortgageable. And that's why it was attractive to buy this property using SAS money. And I'm sure Toby will explain a bit more about that. So I'm going to pass it over <laughs> to him. <laughs> okay, Toby. So tell us tell us how this deal came about. Right. Well, I uh, we have a deal sourcer that uh, sends us deals all the time, every Sunday. Uh, they are, These deals are totally um, bespoke to our uh, investment criteria, constantly updated, really happy with our sourcer. And we pay our sourcer zero because our sourcer is Rightmove. And we've set up Rightmove alerts that every Sunday send us all the deals that fulfill our investment criteria. And then I just spend 10 seconds just scrolling through my phone going, oh, that one looks good. Let's uh, let's dig into that. And so this deal, what I liked about it is you couldn't actually see the house because there was a bush outside the house that got so big, it became a tree. And in the Rightmove photo, you couldn't see the house. So I think, well, that's not a house that someone's going to want to buy and live in. That's definitely investment property. Next thing is this house was like almost half the price of what houses go for in the area. So I thought, hmm, this this looks interesting. Uh, house in the area went for 200K. This house is on the market for 120. So I thought, oh, this is interesting. And then it said cash buyers only. I thought, oh, even more interesting. What I loved, what we love to buy is properties that no one else wants. Because if no one else wants them, then you can negotiate a better price for them. And also you can negotiate slowly because you know no one's going to swoop in and steal the deal from you because no one else will be bidding. Um, so this is kind of like perfect because it's an unmortgageable property. Uh, it doesn't look very good. It obviously needs work. No bank is ever going to lend on it unless you've got cash sitting in your bank account, which people don't. Um, you need to get a bridging firm involved. The bridging firms are quite high fees for when you buy small ticket items of, you know, 120 grand. So great for a SaaS because the SaaS can lend to our limited company in something called a loan back. And we are the, we're the bank managers of the SaaS. We're also the directors of the limited company. So we can decide as, you know, prudent pension member trustees to make a loan to our limited company where with a different hat on, we are the directors of that business to uh, make an investment and uh, make some returns that, you know, then get paid back to to the SAS through interest payments and are secured with a first charge to the to the SAS. So all these things I thought were you know attracted me uh, to this property, and I went to see it, and it was all the things that I expected: uh, swirly carpets, um, bathrooms in uh, sort of an olive green, all matching, mind you. Windows that were installed in like 1918, and, and none of them actually opened. Lots of cracks in the building all the telltale signs of places that people don't want to live in and a place that hadn't been lived in for a couple of years uh, because the old lady was in a, in a home and obviously the family didn't really know what, what to do. So that's kind of what attracted me because you kind of got, in a way, an unfair advantage if you can 
buy in cash with money that you didn't think you had, i.e. pension money, and you can buy something that no one else can buy who has to get a mortgage. These are all advantages. The other advantages of a dilapidated unmortgaged property is if it's not inhabitable, then you don't pay the 3% stamp duty surcharge because if it's not habitable, it's not residential. And if it's not residential, you pay the non-residential stamp duty charges, which up to £150,000 are zero pounds. So there's no stamp duty to pay as opposed to, you know, uh, 3% of the purchase price. So that was another advantage. Another advantage was it's dilapidated in this area, which is Dover. Council tax, you don't pay council tax, you get an exemption if you need to do some structural works. So that's another saving that we, we were able to make. So all these things that will put people off kind of attract, attract me, attract us um, to these, these kind of deals. And guess what? I sent my builder in. I agreed to buy it for asking price because it's so cheap. And this, the market was hot at the time. It was 2021, just kind of post COVID when everything was starting up again. My builder went in and go, you know, that end wall, that gable wall, it's really unsafe. I think it might, it might just collapse. You, you need to go back and renegotiate this. I went, oh, okay. Well, how much is it going to cost? Send me an invoice, uh, an estimate. Oh, it's going to cost 20 grand. So I don't like doing this, but I, I went back and said, look, I know we've agreed 120, but look, I've got this, um, estimate this is what the work's required i sent a rick surveyor as well uh who said it was unsafe uninhabitable i think the vendor knew but didn't disclose this is why it's a cash purchase only and they just accepted the reduction to 100k so great we bought it at 100k so the savings were mounting up there <laughs> the savings were mounting up and of course um we could do this thing called a loan back of the purchase price less uh interest payments um, but actually, in this case, we used a different property BTBR security asset. So basically, we, I think on this one, we, I think we did a loan back of 175,000 because we had a, another property that, uh, we, that was unmortgaged that we were using as giving the first charge to the SAS. And that was quite a valuable property. So, um, we're kind of now getting into how, how loan back works. Yeah. Basically, we <laughs> borrowed all the money to buy the property from our, SAS pension, and we borrowed all the money to do the refurbishment from our SAS pension. Um, so that made it a lot easier. <laughs> so, but so just walk us through, what is the process then, Kate, of, of loaning money from your SAS to your limited company? Well, do you know what? It's, it's just genius, isn't it? Because I can't think of any other, any other way that we could have done that. You know, we've got this pension money sitting there. We want to buy something. You know, we could borrow money at some kind of punitive rate. No, no, no. But the, you just are loaning your money to your property business, which is a legitimate trading entity. And bingo, you know, yes, we we put a first charge on it. As far as I know, the process is very simple because Toby just puts forms on my desk for me to sign, which is probably not what I should say. But it's it's not complicated. And it's exciting because you're just getting your hands on that money to do something, to buy a tangible building that you're bringing back into use as well. I mean, that's the other thing that I loved about this deal. This was a house that was going to fall down, but we've taken something that was dilapidated, unmortgageable, had a tree essentially growing up through it at one point, you know, and we've now turned it into a desirable property that we were renting to a young couple. They've now moved on. And now it's actually being used as temporary accommodation for a local authority. It's kind of come full circle. You know, it's, it's gone back to being a solution to a problem, which is the, this gargantuan housing need that, that there is in this country. This property, nobody wanted to touch it. We were able to use loan back to lend the money to our company, to buy it, to do the work, to put it back into the housing market. And now, it's providing safe, secure accommodation for people. And that excites me. And Toby, there are some criteria about paying back that loan. Um, well, just let our listeners know what, what that is. So a loan back is essentially a business loan from your SAS pension to your limited company. And like all business loans, think think mortgage. Yeah, but the only thing different is rather than the mortgage with, you know, uh, Halifax or, you know, Lloyd's, 
uh, it's from your SAS. So when you get a mortgage, the lender doesn't give any money unless they get a first charge security. So that's number one. You need to have a first charge security uh, that, that, that is given from the limited company to the SAS that is equal to the amount of money that you're borrowing and the interest payments that you need to pay. So one slight difference to uh, traditional mortgages, traditional mortgages and uh, a 75% loan to value, you don't have that rule with a SAS pension. You can do higher loan to value um, because the loan to value is basically a 100% loan to value less the interest costs. So in this particular case, I think the interest that we paid SAS was um, it's 1% above the Bank of England. At the time, the Bank of England was 0.75%. So the interest was 1.75%. We gave a first child security to the SAS that was more than the value of the loan and the interest payments. The second thing to say about loan back is you have to decide a term for it. Now, this is a bit different to, to a, a mortgage because typical mortgages are two or five years. But with a SAS loan back, you can decide it to be one, two, three, four, or five years. And then the other difference is it's a capital and interest uh, type mortgage, which means you have to pay back the capital on an equal basis over the number of years. So if you have a one year loan back, you need to pay at the end of the year, the interest and the capital uh, amount back again. So if you did a loan back for 100K, you'd have to pay the interest and the 100K back after one year. If you decide to do a loan back over two years, you'd have to pay 50% of the capital, i.e. 50K, and the interest payment at the end of year one, and then the end at the end of two year two. If you did a five year, then you pay 20% of the capital back and the interest. So one of the kinks in uh, loan back is you've got to work out how you're going to be able to pay back that capital amount as well as the interest. So it's kind of quite simple if you're effectively using your SAS pension as being a bridging firm, you just do a one year loan and you do the property deal within a year and you get it refinanced in a year. That's pretty straightforward. Uh, if it's going to take more than a year, you need to then decide how many years you want to do for your loan back. We've decided on doing five year loan backs, but we had to have a plan of how we funded that 20% um, capital repayment each year. And when you first saw this property, what was your initial plan in terms of the exit? I think I wanted to buy it, do it up uh, and then flip it as quickly as possible. But like all these things, sometimes things take longer. And I think at the time, I just assumed, I didn't realise, at the time, I just assumed that all loan backs were five years. I didn't realise you could do a one year or a two year or a three year. So we just set up as a as a five year loan back. But then did the local authority get involved, your, your yes, friends there? they did. <laughs> they did. Now, not every local authority gets involved, but, you know, some local authorities really dislike these empty properties because they pull down the whole street. You then get squatters moving in, antisocial issues. People don't want to live in the street. It just it just pulls everything down. And uh, also, the councillors didn't get any council tax from a property that, that's basically derelict that no one's living in that's uninhabitable. So um, this is Kent. Kent has a scheme called the No Use Empty Scheme, whereby they make loans to property developers and investors to bring back empty properties into use. So in this case, uh, we were eligible for a £40,000 interest-free loan for three years. Um, so 0% finance. I think there's about 500 quid of arrangement fees, but, you know, really pretty cheap. And that 40 k basically almost paid for all of the refurb. So that was uh, another nice thing. So we bought this property at 100K, which was a good price because properties in the area were 200K. Uh, we didn't pay stamp duty. We didn't pay council tax. And then the council gave us 40K to do it up. So there were just multiple benefits from buying this property. And this is a property that if we didn't have a SAS, I just would have scrolled on because how am I going to buy that property? I can't. Was it about 140? Was it literally about 40k refurb? So total cost, and then what? What have you done with it since? Well, having worked at Deloitte for 25 years, I'm pretty good at a spreadsheet, and I'm pretty good at Excel. But every time I do this exercise of estimating the budget, I always get it wrong. So there's me thinking, yeah, we could definitely do this for 40k. But guess what? When you start lifting floorboards, you find other things, and uh, I think it was uh, in total. Fifty-seven thousand nine hundred and two pounds. So that went quite a bit over our our budget, but our budget really was forty k because I thought, well, that's what we're going to get from the council, so that's what we're going to spend. Uh, I did break things down. I did have a spreadsheet, but you know, you do just find things in in these buildings that haven't been maintained that 
just need sorting out. So it, this was chunky. But again, we had a £175,000 loan back secured on another property, which was worth more than £175,000. We could have secured it on this property, but if we did that, we'd only be able to secure it on 100 k less the interest payments. So it actually helped uh, that we had another property that was unencumbered. And guess what? We've done several loan backs on the same property, so we can keep on going back to that property and doing more loan backs because it's worth more than the value of the loan backs. So yeah, 60k to do the works. We got the 40k back from the council. We didn't get back 40k from the council. Uh, uh, still doesn't need to be paid off because it isn't three years yet. And then uh, after the works, uh, the property was worth 200k. At that stage, uh, we decided to let it out. Uh, and we got a £150,000 mortgage, so 75% of the 200 k uh, So that obviously pays back the loan back, although we decided on a five-year loan, so we haven't paid back the loan back. We're just paying back 20% each year, and the money is still within the limited company doing other deals, helping to do other deals. So at the end of the day, we spent 157, We got 150000 back, so we got £7,000 still in the deal, but we also got given or gifted... Forty thousand pounds. So actually, none of our money is really in this deal at the moment. We do have to pay this forty thousand pounds back uh, in three years. But um, if we were to ignore the forty thousand pounds, who wouldn't want a, a property that uh, you spent seven thousand pounds on after after everything? That's giving you uh, a nice little income, and it's a it's a nice little baby buy to let. And what's also great is the fact that it was it's gone from being unmortgageable to mortgageable. So. By the mechanism of the loan back, we got the money out of our SAS to do the initial purchase and the refurb and, and all of that. We were able to get a conventional mortgage on it. So you're, you've taken a, a, a dead property, done the work to it, and then raised more money on it. It's almost like a gift that keeps on giving in a way. And then you're able to go and, you know, well, Toby's able to go and do more things within the property portfolio. And that wouldn't be possible without the power of the SAS. Without that ability to loan the money to ourselves to buy something that nobody else wanted to buy, you know, how great is that? And then to be able to get a mortgage on it, um, to, to, to get money out of this property, it baffles me. It, it does literally, I'm struggling to come up with the words for it because it's just, why wouldn't you want to do this? Why wouldn't you? want to be able to to do this with your own money it's just to me it seems like a a completely genius thing once again congratulations because winning the SAS property investor award of the year is a significant achievement and and finally kate what advice would you give others who are considering using SAS at the moment or considering using their pension i should say for property investment and, and what are the key lessons that you've learned from all of these experiences take control and it <laughs> It's about that. It's about getting that control back over your financial future and not just your financial future, but, you know, like we've said several times, the, the financial future of your children or, or the people that you would, you know, if you don't have children, the people who you care about that you want to create a financial future for. If I can understand the basics of a SAS, anyone can understand the basics of a SAS, but do make sure your other member trustees, you know, they're a bit more Toby than Kate, I would say. Uh, but it's it's given me a passion for property that I think it's fair to say, Toby, I didn't I didn't care before we got the SAS. It really wasn't my thing. You know, I've always gone, oh yeah, Toby's doing property, that's his jam. But the SAS I love and I'm a lot more involved in because it is both of us and it is exciting. I can't believe how excited I got going. And, and Christian, you know, we took this money, we got a loan back and then we got a mortgage. I mean, how cool is that? That, would, that wouldn't have been me five years ago. I really wouldn't have cared. But I am excited. And I seem to recall that first meeting with Kevin when he explained about what you could do with SAS. I was like, why don't more people know about this? This is like magic. And it, it does give you that sense of this is really exciting. And I remember it being at the Property Investors Awards and people would go, oh, congrats. I was like, well, have you got a SAS? You need to look at them because SAS is a seriously sexy. And they were like, what? I went... But they are. It's just such. There's such a creative use of money that you you wouldn't even have contemplated. You wouldn't even have thought of. And there are a lot of young. There's a great young generation in property. They're passionate. 
they're, they're going out there and doing amazing things. And I want to say to them, right, the next thing you need to start doing is thinking about a pension and thinking about a SAS because there will come a point where you run out of money. But you know what? If you've got this SAS, you're able to do stuff with that. You're able to leverage it in a way that you can't, you can't leverage other things. And just to have that ability, isn't that exciting? To have that control over your your financial future, your property journey. You might have wanted something shorter and more pithy, but I'm sorry, I get excited about sasses. Well, and, and I know that both of you are still under the age of 50 and look at how much you've leveraged your pension already and, and so many more years to come. And, and you know, you have a son, Max. Um, Toby, you know, in terms of legacy, in terms of passing this on, is, is Max understanding and you starting to have conversations around what you're doing with, with him? Uh, no, because he's nine years old. Okay. But when he's 18, if he, if he plays it right, he'll be added as a member trustee and he can join the SAS. I have to say, actually, I have to interject at this point. There was a very cute phase that Max went through of sitting on Toby's lap on a Sunday when Toby would be scrolling through Right Move, and Max's finger would go, "Stop!" No, I like that one, Daddy, but I don't. Like, I don't like the kitchen. Can we? Can we take the kitchen out? And there were, you know, and I think at his age, it's hard to to comprehend what his dad does, what his mum does. I think there are signs that we could get him involved. At the moment, all he wants to do is go to America and play college football. I don't hold, hold out much hope. He can't even get picked for a hockey s- squad. So, um, but let's not dampen his enthusiasm. And it's exciting. It's, I feel like we have a family firm, even though he is nine. SAS is that family wealth business that, as you say, in, in time, I'm sure, you know, he'll uh, start to pick up some of the lessons and, and start asking more and more questions as to, well, what are you doing? What are all these properties about? <laughs> yeah, he, he is. He, he likes to go and look at the properties far more than I do. And in fact, Toby took it, it. It wasn't a property that we bought in the SAS, but it's a property that we have locally. And Toby had to go there on the weekend. And I was like, no, I'm not coming in. I'll sit in the car. Max's like, I'll come in. And he's like, across the road, up the stairs, telling me all about it. It's like, well, what we're going to do, we're going to put some stairs up to the attic. And then that would be my bedroom. I seem to think he thinks we're going to move into all these houses. But what I take away is he does have a bit of, you know, some spatial awareness, some kind of you know, planning now. So, you know, who knows? And Toby, I'm sure your 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 comments on anyone considering a SAS would be similar to Kate's. Yes, and also uh, perhaps a SAS isn't right for you. Perhaps you don't have any money to put in and you're just starting. But remember, if you understand SAS, it means that you can borrow from other people's SAS. So actually SAS is relevant to everybody, not only the people who have it, but also the people who don't. Uh, who have property businesses or other businesses that require cash to to make stuff happen. And I think one of the big benefits of having a SaaS is we are both lenders and borrowers. Now we've got our own SaaS, we understand what we're looking for as investors in other people's businesses. And that makes us better at then being, you know, business people asking people for funds. So we borrowed from other people's SaaSs uh, to sort support our businesses. So it's basically, I think, relevant for everybody, regardless of whether you want to set up a SaaS for yourself or not. So long as you've got a business that, or, or an idea of a business that, you know, it's going to make money that you need cash for, SaaS is relevant. Thank you once again and congratulations, Kate, Toby. Thanks for being great guests today on Wealth Talk. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so congratulations once again to Kate and Toby there. Lots of lessons for us to draw uh, out. In fact, let's do that just after we have our latest review from Trustpilot this week. So I'm going to head over to our page. And uh, we've had a review come through uh, in the last few days from Stephen, who says, I have really enjoyed being part of this great community where you will have experienced a professional attitude in all areas of finance and wealth. Everything is principle centered, no overselling, just good, solid advice and guidance. I would happily recommend Wealth Builders to anyone wanting to jump on the journey of lifelong learning. Always lovely to be acknowledged when uh, you have success, in, especially in front of all of your peers, all of those other property investors. And, uh, you know, Kate and Toby, what a wonderful evening that was for them. Yeah, you know, and there are so many benefits uh, from actually putting yourself forward for awards. I think I remember reading recently about things like bursaries and uh, scholarships and so on so few people apply for them 
because they think they wouldn't ever qualify. So the starting point is maybe useful to think about. Are there any awards in the business you're in? Find out a little bit more about that. Certainly property investor awards run by a, a very nice chap called uh, Cyril, uh, Cyril Thomas. And, uh, you know, I'm a judge on the awards, uh, not for the SAS. Uh, don't judge people who I have a relationship with. I recuse myself from judging. Uh, but, but nonetheless, it's been great to know that the award winners for the last two years have been uh, inside the wealth builder community and long may that continue because we're well known and uh, with, with, with SAS. But, but the, the point about the awards is if you, if you can get an awareness of what awards are, grants, bursaries, all those things, and just um, take some time to apply. You know, and uh, it's not that difficult. The process is really relatively simple. It's just a filling out a form, really. And once you do that, you're then in the race. And as Kate says, you, even if you're a finalist, you know, you've still got award winners. You think about the Sheffy programs, you know, I'm a bit of a foodie, Chris, and you'll sometimes see, you know, the finalist in whatever it is, you know, Mastermind Chef of the Year or something. And you go, oh, they're a finalist. They must be good. Well, they didn't win. But that's not the point. You know, they're participating at a high level and they're putting themselves out to get known. And I think that's a good thing. And when you get an award-winning credibility, then it's also more likely that people will gravitate towards you. And if you're looking to be investable in the future, then who doesn't want to invite, invest their money with award-winning people as opposed to average people? So what it does is it allows you to think beyond mediocrity into excellence and um, they did an excellent job and now they'll go on to do even more things and i suppose what what surprised me although this is one example of so many i think toby mentioned like 60 something 67 different deals as he calls them you know where the SAS has been involved they don't have to be award-winning because they're making you money every time you do it but bringing old money into play while you're young is something most people don't realize. They think their pension is something to put in a box that says, do not disturb till I'm old and gray, you know, and that money gets lost and forgotten in mind. And often, as we've said many times, gets lost in reality. And money gets lost and forgotten about, and that money simply disappears into the ether of the financial institutions, bank balances in many cases. So I think getting focused on how can you turn your pensions into something that you could do that will help you add value, grow your wealth and contribute to to your wealth journey today while you're young, not wait till you're in your 60s to get it. What that does is foreshortens the journey and brings the wealth in terms of financial security and independence decades forward. So you heard Toby work for 25 years in a company, right? became financially independent within five. You don't need to be waiting for 30, 40 years till your pension works. Look to see whether or not it would benefit you to work now. And I know they were skeptical when they first met. Toby he was like, too good to be true. Okay, you want to really have to go and talk about pension? All that. But they did. So they took the courage of a conviction to come and meet, and that's all they had to do. And I encourage anybody to be curious. That's all I say to people is, look, you're not going to learn what you need to learn to turn your pension into real profit now unless you take the time. And the starting point is not to learn everything and know everything to be a pensions expert in an hour. Take an hour and get curious. And it's that reason to overcome inertia, Chris, that ROI that I've mentioned on many occasions, you know, just find a reason to overcome the inertia of where you are. And for most people, their pensions are poor value, poor returning, not going to come into play until they're in their 60s and, and often get forgotten about. I suppose that delegation very frequently turns into application. And we talked about that in a previous podcast. If you have an asset that you don't pay attention to, it dilapidates. Uh, it's the same in property and it's the same with pensions and Sadly, most people just don't think they can do it. They don't think they've got the right to access it. So just as applying for grants and applying for bursaries, people don't do it. 
people applying for awards, people don't do it. Turning your pension into an asset, people don't do it. And all we're looking to do is, are there somebody out there? Is there a listener out there who's like, that's interesting. You know, I hear what somebody else did. Not, what, why is Kevin Whelan talking about it? Because it's a self-serving business, right? It is, of course. It's a commercially profitable thing for us to do. But the value we bring to other people in their lives is hugely more va valuable to them than the the, the cost that, that uh, we charge to do the work that we do, which is to help people learn about it, get confident, stay compliant, so they feel uh, continually they're making small steps to gradually get the knowledge and the confidence to be able to own and control their own pension just as they would own and, own and control their cash and own and control their businesses and own and control their properties. It's just another asset. But for some reason, uh, people, their heads fry with it. And uh, we're just so grateful. We've helped so many thousands of uh, people cross that bridge and uh, turn their pension into something. And property, more than anything, is a very exciting proposition, isn't it? To stock market ups and downs and roller coasters and ebbs and flows or actually own an asset that pays you rent every month. I don't know. Yeah. So, I mean, if we're picking your interest here with pensions, then please do get in touch with us. We'd be happy to have a conversation with you about your pensions. But um, what's interesting, I think, as well in, in their story is is the dynamics of any partnership or family uh, are very different, aren't they? And who would have thought that their pensions would almost bring them together in a way that they hadn't hadn't experienced before. Because Toby, in some respect, was very much the lone ranger getting on with his property deals. And I wouldn't mind betting, Kevin, that many people listening right now, there's a similar dynamic whereby they're the one who's interested in wealth building or property, and, and perhaps the partner isn't. And they're in the background, supportive, but you know, not really interested. And that was sort of kind of where Kate was, right? Until she had her eyes opened with the power of SAS and, and they brought their pensions together and suddenly it just sparked a, a different dynamic. It did, yeah. It was fun, it was fun to hear it and I know uh, that was very powerful from, you know, from Kate that uh, it did genuinely bring them together. But also you heard from Toby that there are ways that you can start to balance out the value of the pensions as well. And I love the point you made. You said, you know, it's a, SAS is a business and while he might own 9010 or whatever the relationship was, we have to make the decision together. And I think that's a good thing. And uh, for many people, husbands and wives is a perfect combination, as well as business partners and siblings even. Uh, so lots and lots of ways that I suppose historically people see their pension as a like a one-person vehicle, you know, like paddling your own canoe, just one person. Well, all of a sudden, if you've got, two or three or four and the maximum number is 11 which is a pretty big family or a smallish business you've got a turbocharger on the back end there you've you've stuck an outboard motor on the vehicle and off you go and now you're you're powering forward and you're using that money to give you access to build wealth not in your 60s but now and and i think it, it also means at some point you bring your children there i know max is not old enough yet but he will be and when he's 18 he will be eligible to join and that brings life lessons and uh, other lessons um, into play as well. And not least the fact that as a sponge like, you know, smart young lad, he's going to be picking up on what mum are doing generally in their life and in property and in business. So um, I think there's so many benefits that radiate from the simple concept, awkwardly named, clunky by nature, but not clunky by benefits. You know, you got to get your head around it. I get it. But isn't that life? You know, whenever you build wealth, you have to learn new language, Chris. You know, we talk about the language of community and pillars and turning the wheel and all that. We've even got the odd person who comments on, until next time, my friend, see you, all that stuff, right? All good fun stuff. But what's true, though, is you have to learn new language in order to do a different job and accelerate your wealth. And whether that language in this case is SAS a small self-administered scheme, learn it, you know, go and do some research on your own, have a conversation with us, but wherever you go, explore it. If you've got a pension in your life, explore it and then make a decision whether you think it's right for you 
and make a decision whether you think we are right for you. Either way is fine. If the watermark and the tide level gets higher because more people are doing better things for their wealth, I'm happy um, because the community of SaaS owners will grow and uh, some of those will find their way to us, Chris, and I'm grateful for that. And of course, all of this is learnable and uh, the strategy they deployed or several strategies rolled into one really there that Toby talked us through, you know, may sound creative, complicated, but of course, Toby had to begin somewhere. And now Toby is imparting that knowledge to members of Wealth Builders as a coach. He's delivering group sessions, which we really enjoy each month, which talk about creative property strategies. And we covered really the process a few weeks back in the podcast, uh, episode 226 where we talked about the wheel of wealth and the first step is always some education. So there's always a process to follow the education, the support, the connections. And that's the same process Toby followed. And uh, he's just been turning the wheels and, and turning them very successfully with Kate by his side. Mm, and I know he's he's doing other things, you know, in terms of title splitting and other more complex things. But the complexity isn't the reason not to do it. The complexity is the reason to get curious. So it's really just about the pension brought money to the table, right? So you buy dilapidated property. Well, why can't other people buy dilapidated property? Well, they need a mortgage. You can't get a mortgage on dilapidated property. So if you can buy a derelict dilapidated property and your pension can buy it because you're not taking on a mortgage, you're using your own money in your own pension life and using that as a source of the mortgage, then you're underwriting it for yourself and then, you're removing the competitive edge of other people in the property community who don't have cash. And what we know of property owners is they run out of money before they run out of ambition. And, uh, you know, you're, you're, you've got less competition, the more you can creatively finance and the more you can learn about different strategies. So it's self-serving to learn more, you know, not just in from a confidence perspective, but you learn different strategies that give you a potentially anyway, a higher ROI in terms of the return on your investment and a return on your intellect and a return on interaction. And if you're doing good work for society, a return on impact. So many ROIs here that we could get into if we chose to that are so powerful that Toby touched on in the interview you did with him. So we've talked about the transformative power of SaaS today, but uh, also shown some of those steps on that roadmap to financial security, onwards to financial independence. And if you're curious, then head to wealthbuilders.co.uk, take a look around. You can catch up with all of our podcasts there and uh, get in touch with us as well. So we're always happy to have a, uh, and a discovery call. So you can find all of the links on the Wealth Builders website, wealthbuilders.co.uk. And there's some SaaS resources there anyway, isn't there? I mean, it's a whole tab because it's so popular. There's a whole tab on there. So you can go to the Wealth Builders website and click on the SaaS resources and, and, you know, knock yourself out with the start of your journey to get more information. Absolutely. Okay. So. That wraps up today's episode. Thanks for listening. As always, if you enjoyed it, please do hit that share button, send it to a friend. We would very much appreciate that. And Kevin, you and I will be back same time, same place next week. We will indeed, my friend. Until then, see you.